Hey DJs, are you struggling to get gigs or feeling stuck in your DJ career? It's time to level up. Grow My DJ Business is the Discord community designed to help you take your DJing to the next level. Grow My DJ Business offers exclusive coaching content from playlists and checklists to masterclasses led by industry pros. Connect with a network of passionate DJs, share experiences, share music, collaborate on tracks, and get inspired by each other's skills. Grow My DJ Business also gives you access to exclusive DJ edits, curated playlists for every genre, and even opportunities to book gigs. Don't just be a DJ, be a Grow My DJ Business DJ. Join our free Discord server today and unlock the full potential of your career. Click the link in the show notes or check our Instagram profile at Grow My DJ Business Podcast to join now. The Get Down is brought to you by Digital Music Pool. Digital Music Pool is the ultimate record pool for professional DJs looking for the hottest tracks and exclusive hits updated daily in an easy to use platform. You can find exclusive edits from myself, Cream, Adam B, Andrew Marks, Angelo the Kid, Armin Averro, Chumpian, Dan FX, Castra, Pat C, and Samus J only on DMP. And we're giving you a chance to try their service for just $9.99 for the first month. All you have to do is click the link in the show notes or on the Get Down or Cream Instagram pages, create an account, and enter the promo code CREAM at checkout for your discounted month. DMP is my go-to record pool for new and exclusive music to play in my sets. So become a member for just $9.99 for the first month with the code CREAM and check it out for yourself. Click the link in the show notes or on the Get Down or Cream Instagram pages to sign up now. You will not be disappointed. Welcome to the 158th episode of the Grow My DJ Business podcast brought to you by Digital Music Pool and brought to you by the Grow My DJ Business Discord. My name is Kareem. Gary W. here. It seems like forever, but I'm finally back in New Jersey. (laughs) It's been, uh, you know, I took a couple weeks off for vacation. I've been traveling around playing some shows. So we haven't had a pod. So I'm excited to talk about all the stuff that's happened since the last time we talked. Now you know how it feels to be away from home for weeks at a time. Yeah, it and felt good to sleep in my own bed. But I mean, I really can't complain. I was, you know, on the beach and on vacation for one week of like real vacation and then one week of like sort of working, but still on vacation. Yeah. It was awesome. Yeah. I can't, I can't say how much like taking a full week and really stepping away from everything work related, like how much that can really help it helped my mental state and just like I was ready to come back to work when when we were when I was done with that, you know? It was great. We're definitely ready to have you back, that's for sure. <laughs> it's um yeah, it's it's definitely a much needed thing to step away and and in doing what we do and and I think any business owner really, like you don't ever really get to step away. It's very difficult to actually do that. Um and it's that's that's part of owning a business, right? But the other side of it is that you do get a little bit more downtime when you can find it. Um, but it just comes in like little spurts instead of getting a long break, right? It's the it's the pros and cons of being an entrepreneur, right? The pros yeah. are you get to make your own schedule, but the cons are people will be reaching out to you 24-7, seven days a week. Yep. And it's just how you kind of handle that. And I think we've we've done a much better job in handling that in the last few years and figuring out ways to, you know, get away and take time off and adjust responsibilities. So, yeah. Yeah. This year specifically, it's been really good for that. So, yeah. Uh, so the summer so has been very good. Great. Yeah. yeah. What were you saying? I was going to say summer's been, summer's been, been good for, for that kind of thing. And, and it's kind of enables you to go away and, and you got to build in a couple of really cool shows into your quote unquote vacation there at the end and kind of recap that stuff. And, you know, let's hear about your travels and your gigs. Cause you had some really great ones along the way. Yeah. I had some good ones. Um, when I, when I was up New England area and, uh, shout to RM, he hooked me up with some, a couple gigs up there. Um, I played Providence 
uh, Sport and Leisure, which is a new room for me. Super dope concept. I would say for anybody from like the North, from like New York City area, it reminded me of like a little bit of a bounce style place. Okay. Um, I think the biggest song of the night might have been like some 41 for me. They told me it was super <laughs> open format and fun. And I played it sort of like a fun bar set and then still got to go do what I do and play some, you know, tech bass vocal remixes that, that, uh, you know, I like to play. So it, it was super cool. Great venue. Got to meet some owners. Uh, they took me to like a hot dog stand that's been open for over a hundred years afterwards walked through the kitchen, sat down at the counter. Like all they do is make hot dogs and French fries and shakes. And that's all they've done for a hundred years. They're probably the best at it in the whole new England. And it is what it is. I also found out they actually do some like really cool, they have DJs in there and they'll do like after hour shit. They did a new year's Eve party, which I thought was so dope. Man, I, the I, owner was still in there. He's fourth generation. He was like working the counter. It's just, it so reminds me, like when you talk about that, it just reminds me of white man, anybody that's from North Jersey. It just reminds me of white man. They kind of just do, you know, they're known for their hamburgers. They do a couple other things, but like that's predominantly 90% of what's going out that door is hamburgers, right? And, and French fries. Yeah. And like, and, and that's what it's known there. It's been for, uh, been there for now almost a hundred years, I believe. And it's kind of the same thing. I know that their owner, I, I don't know who he is at this point. So it's not like the same regard in that, but like a lot of, you know, places that are very established in our area are that like one, one family owners for generations and the, the place has been around forever and they do that one thing. Well, And it, it got me thinking about like, you know, how do, how do we translate that into nightlife and, and do we have that in nightlife even? And, in thinking about that, it's like, we, we totally do. Right. Like we, the, the places that have now been around for like two generations, like a, like a DJs it's been around since early eighties. I think it's 81 or 82 that they bought that place. It's been around forever. They've just been doing what they do best, which is like four on the floor, ready to rock house music. Right. Like, and that's, you, you know what you're go, getting when you walk in and now, We'll talk about one of the parties that you went and played uh, this past Sunday, which I'll let you actually get into now. And you can talk about that. And that's another party that popped up in my head that I'm like, you, you kind of know what you're getting. Get it. Okay, yeah. So get into the Azure party. So Luke Alexander started a party on a rooftop in Brooklyn. It's called the Azure Day Party. Um, and it's just like feel good, vibey, house music, Afro house. And then like, techno melodic techno and some of the obviously tech house stuff but i played sunday it was like an unbelievable experience i got to play with cases um so it was the first time i got to meet him which was cool because we worked on some stuff together and we've you know obviously sort of met on uh socials but it was cool to like get to hang with him rick wonder popped out he i think he just played last week Ferrari just played two weeks ago so it's like all the guys that we know and love and have had on this show and stuff. And it's everyone goes there knowing what they're going to get, right? There's lines around the block. They sell out every week and they go up there. It's this incredible view. You have New York city skyline in your background, in the background. Uh, There's like a rooftop pool up there. And then there's just a small like DJ setup with two CDJs and a 900, a little sound blocking people off. How's the sound? I'm pretty sound. sure it's incredible. I mean, it's a rooftop venue. So like, it's not, you're not, you don't have like a function one system up there or well, anything, but like yeah. it's good enough sound and a bunch of bass and it's all the sound you would ever need. Right. So like the sound, all the sound you ever need, you have a beautiful view and you have an objective when you go there. Right. And everybody knows what that objective is from the DJs. Right. Right. You're going up there for that sunset set that goes into the night. Uh, Case has played like the, he played like the, the start of the sunset set. And I played like the very start, the very end of it into the night, which was great for me because I got to play more my style. Right. I played that darker sound that I would much rather play than the, you know, happy Afro beat stuff. Right. Uh, which we sort of talked about on one of the previous shows. Um, the, the reason I asked about the sound is because I feel like if, it, you're, you're at a rooftop spot and you know how we have sound ordinances and we deal with all of that b- 
bullshit all the time in our area specifically. If you didn't have that kind of sound, does that party still exist? Like you have to have all of these elements working together in order to to create right. this recipe for success, right. right? They have real DJ equipment, three thousands and a nine hundred. They have a real DJ booth set up with two speakers on either side and subs. They have real dance floor sound with enough punch. They have lighting for the nighttime. They have cryo for the night for for drops and stuff. You know, any any ownership it's a, it's that's a, it's 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 the recipe for success. <laughs> any ownership and management that listens, like this is this is it. Like this is this is all it takes. Like if you have there are plenty of spaces that could have successful parties that you and I have walked in and out of and even DJ for years that could have very, very good parties if it was if it was executed properly. Now, we don't we we are on the outs where we don't know the the politics and the backdoor things that happen as far as um, you know we're always dealing with neighbors that are complaining about bass whether that's inside or outside I'm talking about both there was a decibel reader that I could see as I was DJing no one ever told me like don't break this number right but I saw it in the corner up there like 96 decibels like I was like shit better not break 100 kind of thing I don't know I don't know what the number is but I'm sure there's a number that they can't break up there that's helpful, right? Having a decibel reader in, there, in a room that has sound restriction. You know, we don't have that. I have never, haven't seen that in a room that <laughs> I, I we play in. I don't know if I've ever DJed with a decibel reader, but I thought that was funny and cool. You see it, you see it like when, whenever you see uh, festival uh, footage or like reels or TikToks, you, you always see it. It's, it's on there somewhere on the, on the screen, whether you have, you have the time, you know, the timer, and then you have the decibel reader as well. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of funny that you had that in the, in the venue, but that makes sense. But to go back to what we were saying, like these guys just, you, you have, you have an established identity, you know, and that's been, and we, this has been time and time again, we've talked about this on the podcast that has been what's working. Right. And I like, I'll, I'm going to tell you right now, I went and played a, and on a much smaller scale than the user day party or the, or DJs or anything like that. But I went and played a Britney night and I thought it was going to flop and I thought it was going to be terrible. It, it, the venue I thought didn't match what the Britney night was and it wound up working and it worked well. And I was shocked and I have, you know, plenty of Britney remixes as well as her regular stuff and got to really mix it up and go in a lot of different places with just her music and then the crowd that that brought in was you know enabled me to then also bounce around to other places such as you know girly pop but also some like disco stuff which sounds weird but like that's kind of the crowd that i had in there um so i you're right and we've been saying it over and over again like having these established parties where party goers know what they're getting into is really, really hitting right now. And is this going to peter out at some point soon? Possibly because people might get sick of it. But I think getting back to the, like we used to have getting back to the hip hop room, getting back to having the hip hop, the house room. Like if you have a venue that has two rooms and really separating it, you know, that, that line got blended when, you know, AM came onto the scene and Beat Breaker, obviously, blending, you know, things for Crooklyn Clan and um, just that whole 2006, 2007, 2005 to 2007, all of those DJs that really made open format what it is now. I feel like getting back to that pre-2005 to where you had the separate rooms, like I'm saying, and you have house music in one room, hip hop in the other room, or you could do straight open format in, in the other room or whatever you want to do, but just have, have an identity. I think the lack of identity is hurting, hurting venues and always has. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And, and I, I don't think open format DJing will ever be dead. And I think as DJs to learn to play every genre and play them together and mix, go up and down in speeds, that makes you a better DJ. That makes you, that you earn your chops doing that. You earn your chops playing the private events where you have to play all these genres in different age groups. And then once you have that in your tool belt and you can do that, then you can go be more of you know, a specialist. I want to be a house DJ. I want to be a hip hop. I want to play Afro and reggae and on Latin, like whatever the case may be having that stuff. I don't, you need that as a DJ, but 
open format rooms are dead. Shoot me, uh, kill me in the comments, whatever you want to say. Right now, what is working are very specific, genre-specific parties. People go there because they know what they're going to get. They're not walking into a place and maybe they hear five songs they really like and then the DJ switches it up and they don't like the next five songs and they leave. People are going to parties where they, they are going to hip hop and ribs. They're going to the Azure Day party because they know what they're going to get. It's an experience. They're getting something that they want. If you like house music and you like Afro house, you go to the Azure Day party. If you like hip hop and R&B, you go to hip hop and uh, R&B and ribs party. Like, I, I just think that is the formula that's working. You like country music, you go to the country bar, right? You want to hear Bad Bunny, you want to hear Raul uh, Alejandro, you go to the Latin party. And those are the parties that are doing the best right now. That's it. If you want to be successful, you have to have a very specific thing that you're telling your customers that you're doing. And as a DJ, it's the same thing, I think. You have to have an identity of what you are. Who are the people that you cater to? What are, what's the style of music that you play? And I think now more than ever, it's extremely important that it, on your socials and the type of music that you're playing and the mixes that you're putting out, you showcase what you do. It can, I guess it can be open format. You, open format will never die. I just think the open format rooms right now are not doing as well as these very specific style parties and, and, and rooms. I think there's a very finite distinction to be made here. I think the mid-level to high-end parties all have an identity, right? I think everything that's like what we would consider like a low-level DJ gig, what everybody would consider like a low-level DJ gig, somewhere maybe if you're just starting out, your corner bar, your local bar, that's that you're going to make your chop. Like you said, you're going to make your chops in open format there. You're going to have to work that room, right? Because you're going to have all different types of people in that room. People aren't specifically coming to that space for music. People are going to that space to drink, right? What I talk about mid-level is like, I don't even want to say bottle service because that's not accurate, but like mid-level, like you're, you're just mid-level DJ gig or I don't want to put a, a number on it, but like some place that, you know, it, you're run of the mill booking. That's not that that right. the average DJ is that well, local DJ still aspire to play. It's a high, maybe a higher end party in your market, right? I think establishing some kind of identity in those in those venues is important. Yeah, but I still think those venues they can do they can do like party specific nights. You can That's do Britney saying. Spears yeah. night at a, at a bar and then you could do like rock yeah. night or you can you do could. reggae night or whatever, whatever it is, because you're telling your customers what they're going to get. People pay tickets to go to Brooklyn Mirage, to go see Taylor Swift, to go see Beyonce because they know what they're getting. Yeah. There's no question in a time where money is really tight, when people are going out to spend their money, they want to know what they're going to get. And Doing these specific genre or artist specific parties, people know what they're going to get, and they're okay spending their money on that. Yeah, and I think I think all level places can can do this. Like even if you're the local bar, you can still do it. You know, right? Yeah, I don't know. I, I think concerned. Rick Rick Wonder said said this on a on the Road Podcast, and I know uh, some of the 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 people on that show kind of fought back with him, but I don't know. I, I just really think that to be successful, you have to have an identity, whether you're a DJ or a venue right now. And that's just what it is in 2024. Well, that's what that, I mean, Rick pivoted hard. He was, he's, he's an incredible open format DJ. Unbelievable. One of the, he was one of the best in New York city for a long time. You know, we, we we've played plenty of, uh, of venues that he's been through and, 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 Venues that he came up in, that he was the best open format DJ in that venue or in, in those several venues that we were in there with, with, with him. And he pivoted straight to, to going to more EDM, you know, style, big room style and focused on his production. And, and he's right. And that's where and he, he's blown up tenfold because of that. Yeah. So yes, I could see where he's coming from on that. 100%. Like I was saying, too, he has that open format chop so that even if he's in a room that they hired him to play his music, right? Like 
he can pull from past experiences or pull a track out that maybe he wouldn't normally play, but he knows is going to work and help the room or he goes to a new city and it's not a house music only venue. Like having that background and being able to do that makes you a better DJ and a better artist when you do specialize. Yeah. Not only can he do it, he can do it in an impressive fashion. Right? Yeah. That, and sure. that's an, and that's an even, that's an even you know bigger feather in his cap. Um, what do we talk about? Like we, we work with a lot of DJs, right? The hardest thing for me is when we're working with a DJ and I say to Gary, like, I don't know what this DJ, what this person is. I don't know. I don't know what their identity is. I don't know what rooms to put this person that, to me right now. That's, that's a struggle that I have. So if you're a DJ listening to this, ask yourself, what is your identity? And if, whatever that is, are you portraying that and putting that in, out into the world? And if you're not, you need to figure out a plan and a way to do that. It's really important right now. Like, yeah, if, you, the, if you're a tech house person and you're producing tech house and that's what you're doing, don't make a dubstep mix. Don't make an open format mix that you're promoting if that's not what you want to be. Now, have those mixes in your back pocket so if someone wants to book you open format, you can send it to them and you can do it. It shouldn't be the featured mix on your on your socials, though. Right, but don't make it the featured mix on your 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 Instagram profile <laughs> right. or your, your socials. Your featured right. mix should be what you do what, and what you do best. Right, because everybody's looking at that. It doesn't matter if it's the highest end place or the lowest end place. There, everybody's looking at your socials as your resume. As we always say, time and again, make sure that shit is clean. Make sure you're featuring mixes that showcase what you do and who you are. And if you're a, a completely open format DJ, make sure you have a mix that showcases that, you know, if it's everything from disco to Afro beats, then make sure you have a mix that showcases that because you, you could do it, you know, and, and make, make sure that that's the one that you, you have up. Um, because I feel like that's the hardest thing, right? Especially as somebody who does do that. That's the hardest thing is, is to, Hey, what do you play? I play everything. Well, that's a really boring answer, right? I have people ask me that all the time. Well, I play everything. No, like I literally play everything. Like, but it, that's, that's, it's a boring answer. Like, so what do I have to show people that I play everything? Right? Right. So you have to make sure you have a mix that showcases all of that stuff or make sure that whatever you're showcasing your mixes on, whether it be a SoundCloud page, whether it be your website, make sure that you have a series of mixes labeled very specifically, this is what these things are. You know, this is my Afro mix. This is my disco mix, et cetera. Yeah, I think that's great advice. I, I, things are changing and we as DJs and producers have to change with what's popular and what's happening in the market. And this is what's happening in the market, you know? Yeah. I think I, one thing that really started like weighing on me and made me really kind of, I'm still doing open format, right? I'm still playing rooms that most rooms we play, like there's not a lot of parties where I can just go play 128 the entire time. There, right. There's a, a good amount and I'm picking and choosing more of those because that's what I want to do but I'm still doing some open format or some of the parties I'm playing still require me to play 15% hip hop and Latin, let's say. Right. Yeah. But like what pushed me away from wanting to play those open format spots would be like playing a room where I find a pocket of people that are into one thing. Right. Or I get a request and I go down a rabbit hole and we start playing one thing. And then this other pocket of people is booing me or is pissed because they want me to play something completely different that I was playing maybe an hour ago. Yeah. And then another group of people, like they might be vibing, but they want to hear Jersey Club. And then another group of people, they want to hear EDM classic bangers. But like you can't make all of those people happy at the same time. You have to rotate through. And it's like you could never make anyone happy. And I don't like feeling that way. I it's part of that is part of that is maybe the room, the particular room that I'm talking about doesn't necessarily have the identity. So you just get this group of people that you're trying to make happy. Yeah. But like, and like, that's a room that I don't play anymore or want to play anymore because I don't want to feel that, that I'm not doing a good job because there's different groups of people that want different things and you can't make them all happy. You can, but you have to like, you just got to move so fast and I'm okay yep. doing that. Right. But I don't want to do that. <laughs> right. It's work. I just don't. It's a lot of work for in, a, in, in a long period of time in a lot of these places, right? You know, the elongation of DJ sets has really ruined. The, uh, 
this I don't think we've brought this up. The elongation of, 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 of DJ sets has really ruined open format, in my opinion. Four-hour sets, you could do four-hour sets of open format and be very effective and be very interesting. Right, because you're moving fast, you're working hard, you're jumping through genres, and it's not that you're not working hard and moving fast while playing one specific genre, but your brain is working like quadruple time because you're trying to fit all these pieces together. In in a five-hour to five-and-a-half-hour set, which we're seeing more and more in our market that that, pe- that ownership and managers are demanding and then still want an effective open format set, it's not realistic. It's not realistic. We tell, we tell owners all the time that our DJs are not going to be as good after the fourth hour. And that's just part of the way that we sell it. But like I, you and I both think that's really true. And that's I honest, truly you know? believe that, for sure. For sure. Yeah, we can all do it. Can you we all go in and do it? Absolutely. Fine. Absolutely. But is is it going to be as interesting? Like those 10 minutes each hour of filler because I'm, you know, don't want to burn everything out. Well, you pull the, that down and now that's 40 minutes gone in your, uh, of your five hour set. And, you know, now you can have more of a, a finite four hour, effective, interesting, very energetic DJ set instead of pushing this out over five, five and a half hours. Right. There's plenty of times where I'm like, I'm, I tell you all the time, I'm going sometimes at nine 45. I shouldn't have even started till 10 o'clock. Right. Well, and, and part of this is also just like the, the different, what, what's working again now. And it, it's moving quickly. It's playing energy from the jump. Like there is no opening anymore. There, I I truly believe that. Like you're, yes, you're an opener, but you st- you have to br- you have to bring energy from the first song you play. I used to talk about this when I would go play casino sets. Right, I'd open at a casino, and it's energy from the second w- Jump Street because someone's there celebrating and partying, and they're there to have a good time, and that's what the casinos wanted. But now it's every single room that we play. You know, yeah, because people every don't room. have people don't have the attention span that they once did. Right, there nobody is patient enough to sit through an opening set at this point. They want to hear what they want to hear now. And just as you were saying, it's like if I don't hear what I want to hear now because we live in a very, you know, unattentive, very privileged um, world at this point. It's they're going to move on to the next place. So we're in this place where we have to be energetic and we have to be attentive to what people want who are in that room at that point. It's, it's nobody not cares about the opening. Yeah. It's not, it's not that there's the art of opening is still a thing. You still have to be an opener. If you're in that position, you can't play the biggest records. You can't play the highest energy records. You can't be, you know, play the, put your hands up records, but there's so much music out there and there is a way to play high energy, up tempo stuff that the crowd is going to be into. And you're still not burning the, the, the headliner. If you know, if that's how your night is broken up and, you're not letting songs play out. You're quick mixing from the jump. And that's yeah. different too, you know? And and you're playing a lot more songs. So things have changed in that regard too, you know? Yeah, for, for sure. Um, well, let's rewind this completely back like to, you know what? Like, let's let's talk about the basics. Let's talk about new DJs, right? And how to, how to establish yourself when you when you're first starting out and then building yourself up into this place where like you have an identity you have an identity as a dj and you and you've established a good base of fundamentals in order to build skills upon you know the things that you should be doing as a be very beginner dj i was i i had come up there um for some family things i had to take care of up north kind of on a whim and i was in one of our venues uh on a monday night and there was not one of our DJs wasn't on. There was they had another DJ. I thought I, I thought you were in Florida when you heard this. I didn't even know it was from up here. I was in one of our venues. So it was one one of our venues, not one of our DJs though. It was a Monday, <laughs> which is <laughs> you're gonna get a kick out of that, I guess too. I don't even know. And, I can't uh, wait to hear about this because I don't even know about this. I, and, I assumed this was in Florida. <laughs> no. So we're sitting there. We're having dinner. Right. Food was great. We had a good time. Food was good. We're having a couple of cocktails. Um, uh, my whole family. And then like my aunt, my uncle, a couple of cousins, it was, it was good. But we hear that they're, they're doing like a night next door. It, they were doing uh like a game night, bingo, trivia, whatever it was, something. And 
I hear it happening and the game that they're doing, whether it was bingo or trivia, is moving at an absolute snail's pace. And now I'm like, all right, this guy's never done a night like this. He's never done bingo night in his life, right? I'm like, okay, fine. Not a big deal. Now he's starting to mix and I'm like, this guy can't fucking mix anything. He couldn't mix like nothing. There was like nothing that he can, the most basic beats he couldn't mix together, right? Then every 35 seconds, he was using his drop, right? So now I'm like, all right, there must be a bunch of people over there playing like bingo because like he's playing the super energetic music, he's train wrecking everything and he's playing his drop every 30 seconds. I was like, so the, the, the room's got to be filled, right? Like this all, I'm, I'm in a different room playing up what the other room looks like in my head. As a DJ, if I was to be doing this, I would only be doing some of these things if I had a filled room, right? I mean, he's focused on the music. He's not focused on the, on the bingo portion of the night, right? So he's there for, for bingo, but he's, he's rather train wrecking garbage music the entire time. You know, and so he's he's not doing his job in any fashion. Zero way is he doing his job. And I could just tell, like, okay, this is just a new DJ, right? I get up. I go to get another drink. My family leaves. I go get another drink at the bar. There's three people. Three people in the room. Actually, there was six. The old lady and her and her friend got up because he wasn't finishing bingo fast enough, and they left. So he loses a huge percentage of the customers because he's not being effective at his job. Sounds like a bad booking by the venue. Sounds not like they good, needed a get down DJ in there. I, I, I think so too. <laughs> and um, I'm not saying that for that, but I, I'm saying this because as a new DJ, I think you need to walk in and you have to know your purpose and you have to know what you should be doing and you should know what you should be doing well, right? So if you're booked to be a bingo DJ, if you're booked to be a trivia guy, that's what you do. That's your focus. It's not for DJing that night. And if you are going to DJ, make sure you know how to mix and make sure you're playing the correct music for the venue that you're in, right? You're at a local bar on a Monday. They don't want to be, he had a couple tracks that were good. Like there was like a freestyle track that played that like fit like this table that was there. Um, he should have been playing like a couple more older tracks for the older people that were there. That wasn't there. like the, the 50 cent and then like also like the Kendrick Lamar, like that just, yeah, the Kendrick Lamar just did not work, you know? Um, and, and I, I think just honing those very basic things, clean mixing, music selection, organizing your music in a way that's effective for the, for the gig that you're at. All of those things need to be impeccable when you first start out. Because realistically, if you're a new DJ, you don't know who's in the room. We talk about this all the time, too. There was 15 to... Actually, no, I'm sorry. Our table was 12. And then there was probably another 15 to 20 people in the, in, in the other room, right? And out of those 35 people, there was a booker in the, in the room. And I, would, I was going to walk up and introduce myself. And I thought, at the way that he handled the night, there wasn't a shot ever that I was going to go up and say who I was and, yeah. and give him my card. So you have to like make sure all of these things but before you take a job. Like, I feel like you should really ensure that you at least have one of these things in line, whether that's mixing, whether that's song selection, whether that's just executing the, the, the bingo night or the, or the trivia night correctly, because if he did, if he even just did that, well, I would have went up and, and got his information. Could always use a bingo guy. Could always use a trivia guy, right? We'll worry about the mixing. We'll, we'll, we'll get you there. We'll get your song selection there. That's not a big deal, you know? But because he didn't do any of those things correct, it probably cost him some work. You just don't know who's in the room. And that goes for established DJs that are doing low, extra low, lower, we call them lower end gigs. I'm, I'm quoting if you're listening to this. Um, I'm not watching. Uh, lower end meeting, just like these low leverage gigs where you're like, maybe it's a brunch and it's a little slower. Well, you don't know who that guy at the bar is that that's listening to you. You don't want to be lazy because you, you, you might be passing, um, you might be passing gigs up right there because you're being lazy because you think that nobody's in the room, you know? Uh, so 
I don't know. It, it's just, I haven't heard a brand new DJ in such a long time. And it, and it made me think about all of these things. It made me think about what I did when I was a young DJ too. And like, and, and how I try to grow and, and, and be in situations where you are always a student of, of you're always just being a student, right? If that old lady came up and she said she wanted to play Frank, hey, can you play Frank Sinatra? I'm like, well, I have 50 cent on. Well, how am I going to mix these two? Right? Like, what am I going to do in order to make this sound clean? Sounds like my nightmare. <laughs> but this is what you deal with when you're 19, right? And you're 18 years old and you're DJing in the local bar. Right. Like, I mean, you didn't really do that as much as I did. I did that for many, many years, like many years of just standing in the local bar and like DJing for the eight, the 60 year old guys in the room that all wanted to listen to Zeppelin. Right. And it's like, I oh, how am I going to, and I hate it now, <laughs> but, but what I'm saying is for these younger guys that are, that are just coming up, like if you, you know, if you can get out of those rooms and you can rock those rooms effectively, like you're really prepared for anything. Once you get out of that space, it's working your way out of that space. That is very hard. Yeah. I mean, some of the stuff you're talking about is just like the most basic stuff of DJing. It's like, I, all right, I well, feel like we, we talk about all the high end stuff. Sometimes you got to talk about the most basic, the bait, get back to the basics and the fundamentals of it. That guy, yeah, I mean, don't I, think about. you can, you can think about it from how we judge and listen to DJs, right? Like the first thing I'm going to listen to, the first thing I'm going to take notice of is, is how clean you're mixing, right? If you can blend songs and, you don't have to be a crazy, you know, Red Bull three style style DJ to be impressive. You can be impressive by your music selection and the way that you create a flow in the room and how you move through genres. And that that's, that's okay too. You know, like that's, that's important. That's the first thing that someone who's listening to you is going to, is going to see and hear. Uh, the music selection is is super important too, and that's your taste and your ear. And I can't teach you that. Gary can't teach you that. That's on you. Some people have great ears, amazing taste. Some people don't have any taste or don't have a good ear. And sorry to say, like those people probably aren't going to make it very far in the DJ world. You know, yeah. Like the DJ is the taste maker and is the person who kind of is creating the vibe and, and you have to have that. And if you don't have it, it's really hard to teach someone that I think. Yeah. Um, the music selection stuff, like on a very simple level, your organ, the way you organize, download and organize music is the most important thing. That, the next most important thing that you can focus on after your DJ skills, right? Create those crates, do it in a way that makes the most sense for you. How can you find music? How can you move through genres quickly and easily and, and find the stuff that you need to play? Um, and then like Gary said, when you're in, when you're in the room, it's like you're mixing cleanly and you're playing and you're showing some energy and being excited, being excited to be there. Like that's the next thing, right? Do you look miserable up there? If I walk in a place and a DJ looks miserable, like I'm not going to say what's up to him. But if that person's rocking out and they're dancing and they're smiling and they're high-fiving people and they're interacting with the crowd, like that shows me that you love to be there and you love DJing. And it doesn't matter if you're playing Brooklyn Mirage or you're playing a local spot that you're just creating, you're making it fun for everybody that's there. So that's the next thing I'm going to look for. And then the final thing is like, if I do come say what's up to you or I talk to you after the, the, the set, you got a little bit of a personality and you can talk to people and you know how to interact with the staff. And that's an important part of it too. And I think as a young DJ, if you focus on those couple things, those three things, like that's a great way to get started and, and, you know, start to, to get your foot in the door and make a little bit of a name for yourself beyond just being a bedroom DJ. Fantastic advice. I love it. Man, baby DJ life. It, it's hard. So it's one of, it's, it's, it, every level, to level up on every level is very hard in thinking about it. I was going to say, but my knee jerk reaction was to say that's the hardest, <clears throat> that's the hardest level up is getting out of the bar, but it's, it's not. Every level is difficult. Yeah, it's snowball. I think it's a snowball effect, right? It, it's the 
getting the ball rolling is always going to be the hardest part. But once you get the ball rolling down the hill, you start to pick up some momentum and some steam. And if you can take advantage of that, you can grow relatively quickly if you're skilled and you have the networking capabilities and some social media. I mean, like, you can move quick if if you got the juice. Yeah. If you don't got the yep. juice, I mean, you're going to be stuck. <laughs> you're going to be stuck in the same spot. Me and RM talk about that all weekend, if he's got the juice or not. <laughs> shout to rm man took care of me all weekend bought me dinner let me stay at his house like a1 not, that that guy a1 and one great. of the best djs that you'll ever see in here i haven't seen him in a long time i gotta make sure i'll we'll be sure in here in november him. we got him we're coming he's coming down maybe i gotta go up before it gets too damn cold you should he's got a room up there right now in boston that's like gary w 101 yeah. You would crush uh, sport and leisure too, man. Yeah. From what was, I heard. It was a cool spot. We had dinner before. It was it was good. Um, to go back on something, I, I, I'm going to, this might be taking our conversation off the rails a little bit, but I think, you know, we talked a lot about the venues and DJs that are more established, like having identities. I think as a young DJ, you're, you're doing everything, but your goal is to start building that identity, but you have to build the foundation first. And then you could start talking about, well, I want to be this style of DJ, right? Um, I, I don't know. I, I think that's, that's something that you can get to. And, you know, there's ways to do that. And, and social media is going to be one big way, but the mixes and some of the stuff we talked about earlier is another. I'm trying to figure out how to transition into this other topic that I want to talk about. I, I think that something... I, I, something we we I've talked to multiple DJs about here recently. It's DJs who are doing both nightlife and private events. And Gary, we didn't even talk about this, but it was something I really want to talk about because I think it's important for everybody to hear. I think it's a great thing if you're playing in both worlds, right? You can learn a lot about being a club DJ by being a private event DJ. You can learn a lot about being a private event DJ by being a club DJ and taking some of that stuff back and forth. I think the best DJs can and have done both things. But if you're a DJ that wants to play in both worlds, you have to consistently play in both worlds. You can't dip into the, the nightlife scene when the private event scene slows down and vice versa. And, and specifically for some of the private event DJs that we've worked with, and I've had these conversations with a few of them already. You know who you, know who you are out there. <laughs> like if you're starting to build momentum in nightlife, you can't just completely disappear when the seasons change and your private event stuff picks up. You have to make sure that you can somehow balance both. You got to save those night, like nightlife gigs or, or dates for nightlife when the private events come back and, and vice versa. Like you still want to do some private events even during the slow season, right? Like keeps your, keeps your sword sharp and, and keeps you, uh, you know, working with those companies or with the people who are you booking you in both worlds. Like you I can't build momentum in nightlife and then disappear for a quarter kind of thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, it you hear it all the time on both ends, right? You t I, I've talked to countless over the years, countless private event DJs that want to be club DJs. It's it's just oh it's uh, for whatever reason naturally what people want to do and then when club DJs if you're not being booked and you or you get booked for you know a wedding or something or and then you start to get momentum doing weddings and things like that like people I've seen people start leaning into that more because the money's better um, but then they still want to come back and do the nightlife thing and it's very difficult to then come back if you've then like you said leaned into the night uh, into the private event thing so hard that you kind of got forgotten about in the nightlife space. That's what's going to happen, right? Because I've seen it happen to three different nightlife DJs that I came up with that we've tried to do both together. And I've seen them lean so hard into the private event space that they tried to come back to nightlife. And it was like, right, they their, their window has closed. At that the point. window closed and it was gone. And, and it was, they didn't have the, the connections that they once had you know, management had changed in the venues that they were at. So nobody knew who they were and it, it became very difficult for them to come back and they never, they actually never came back. These two or three people I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, so you really have to find a balance in, in, in doing both and, and understanding 
when to take your foot off the gas on one and when to put your foot on the gas in the other. Yeah. I, again, it goes back to having an identity, right? Are you a private event DJ or are you nightlife DJ? You can do both, but you'll never be the best in either space if you're going to do both. Yeah. I, that's my opinion. I mean, we've, you know, we've talked with Angelo the Kid about this a lot years ago, years ago. And Mikey Perari was like the first, the number one person saying, Angelo, never book another wedding ever again, kind of yeah, thing, I mean, right? <laughs> but and yeah. at the time, Angelo knew what he wanted to be and where he wanted to go. If you're a DJ and you know what your ultimate goal is, why are you doing this other stuff? You know, it's only getting in the way. It's only hurting you from reaching those ultimate goals. Everybody's goals are different, right? Maybe you, maybe you just want to do both and make money. And I understand the money side of it because that plays a big role too, right? You're a full-time DJ. You have to make money to pay the bills. And those private events are usually big money makers, right? Yeah. So I get it. But if you're a DJ that wants to ultimately be an artist, right? You want to make music. You are making music already. You're playing some pretty good shows. You can't just disappear and go do night uh, private events because it's busy and you have every Saturday booked in private events. You just can't do that. If your ultimate goal is to be an artist and be to play the biggest shows that you can play. You'll never be looked at as fully a nightlife DJ, right? Because you, you have to, full, like you said, you have to fully commit and, and that's looked at upon your peers. That's looked at upon ownership and management and, and bookers in the area. That's, that's, that's everybody, everybody will look at you like, okay, you just want to do half and half. I've had multiple conversations in the last week since I've come back with venue owners and managers that have said to me, isn't that DJ a private event DJ? I haven't seen them post anything about nightlife. And I literally, I said, I want to book this person. They said, isn't this person a private event DJ? What can, how, how can they bring it? Can they bring people out? Like what have they done in nightlife lately? So like, this is a thing, not just DJs watching. This is bookers and owners and, and like, guys, they see what's happening. They see what you're doing. There's a reason why we're posting all the shit we post, right? They see it. Yeah. So yeah, so, so I just think in talking about this like focused identity driven things we've been talking about today, I wanted to bring that up because it's something I want you to think about, right? If, if, if it's the summer and it's the slow season and your heavy nightlife season is starting in the fall like it is around here, you can't tell me as a DJ, you don't have any dates to give me for nightlife if you want to be a nightlife DJ. It just slows your momentum. It hurts, it hurts the, you know, that, that ball we've been talking about. Like, it slows that snowball down. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that you're not going to work nightlife anymore, but it's a, what have you done for me lately type thing? And it's, you know, it's just, it's just how our industry is. And I'm not talking about me and you, I'm just talking about in general. Yeah. We live in a very specifically, specifically very cutthroat, very competitive DJ market where it's very difficult for guys to do both. I think there are definitely there are definite markets that you you can excel at both, but I think our market specifically, and, and I don't know, you know, I don't know very, I don't know every market. I'm thinking of like two or three different ones that I know that guys that do dip into both and and are pretty good at both, but, um, but it's so cutthroat. It's it's next man up every you definitely, every you can week. Definitely do it. You just can't disappear from each. Like you can't just completely, yeah. like. For example, if, if, if I was someone who was trying to do both, I would try to line my schedule up where if there's four weeks in the month and I have eight total Fridays and Saturdays, I'm going to try to do four nightlife and four private events. That's how I would try to set up my thing. And I get it. The private events come across your, your, your plate. It's, it's good money. But like, there's got to be a way where you can still make money on the private event and send another DJ. Yeah. Like there's got to be. We, we've been doing it, right? Like, I, can't, yeah, I don't want to play any private events. Yeah. Because I'm trying to do this nightlife thing. And I look at it like, yeah, it's great money, but me playing a private event does nothing for what I'm trying to do. Right. Yeah, ATK. No private events allowed. We, he was banned from booking weddings. 
<laughs> He's going to laugh when he hears this. <laughs> oh, man. All right. Want to get into this last topic? Yeah, I was listening to one of the save podcasts. This one? I was listening to one of the podcasts I, I listen to on a daily basis, it's like a business, whatever, business news podcast. And they there was a story that I heard this morning that said that cassette tapes are at a 20-year high in sales. And I didn't know this was even something that was happening behind the scenes that like younger people are like basically buying cassette tapes as like collectibles. How many people would even know how to use a cassette tape <laughs> if they had like a boom box in front of them, right? That are listening to this. <laughs> Nobody that's under, I don't think anybody that's I, under 30 years old. I think, I think how 35? to is one. I think how, how to is one thing. I think how many people listening to this podcast have ever used a cassette tape? Period. Yeah, that's good. I think that's probably a better, <laughs> a, a, probably a better question. Gary, I don't think I've picked up a cassette tape or used a cassette tape in, since I was like a little, little kid. Like, Cream, cassette tapes stopped being made, you ready? In 2002, 2003. Stopped being made. So major labels stopped producing cassette tapes in 2002, 2003 in that area, right? So that means anybody who's 20 to 24 years old, right? They were born between 2000 and 2004. During that span, cassette tapes stopped being made. They were zero. One year old. Yeah, like I had, I was listening to CDs and like my disc man. Those, and then my those MP3 kids... Players. Were, some of those kids were not even born. If you're 21, you were not born when cassettes stopped being made. So therefore, there's no nostalgia in that because your parents weren't using cassettes. Whereas when we were kids, I got addicted to vinyl because my dad had a stack of vinyl. Yeah. And I loved to put vinyl on. I liked the act of it. And I let's be real. I liked scratching his vinyl when I was like six years old and he'd want to kill me because it literally scratched because, you know, it's a, a diamond tip needle and it's not made for scratching and it literally scratches the records. Yeah. <clears throat> so you'd get killed for things like that. I can remember scratching Bruce Springsteen. I thought I, I was going to get thrown through the wall. We have a, um, you know, we have a nostalgia. We have, there's a yeah, nostalgic connection. New again. It always comes back around at some we, point. But you Technology and I have a maybe not as much, but I guess a little bit right now. But I, what I'm saying is I think we have a nostalgic connection to vinyl. What are kids, 21-year-olds right now, connection to cassette tapes? Yeah, I don't know. There, there, there is none. My dad had a wall of cassette tapes when I was a little kid in the basement. I, I still have I mean, we, I he still had have a ton of vinyl too. and that's But like you get in the car, my dad would put a cassette tape on, right? I think. Or, I mean, obviously CD mostly, but like when I was really little, he had cassettes. Really, really, really little. My, my dad was a, was a big, um, he was big into electronics. So like, I don't remember anything but CDs. Like he had, I think he might've had like the first CD player. <laughs> like, and, <laughs> I, and I, I talked that. to him. Your dad, your dad being all about the new tech. I talked to him like, dad, like you couldn't afford that. He's like, no, absolutely. I couldn't afford that, but I bought it. <laughs> <laughs> like he had the best stereo. His stereo system was ridiculous. The sound was insane. And it was all like 1985 and CDs. I was just looking this up. Like CDs came out in 82. Right. So like they were relatively new and like he was buying these CDs like in, in 85, 86. Um, that's nostalgic. Like CDs are still even nostalgic to us. Like, and that's why people use CDs still that are, that are our age. My cousin has, that's what my cousin uses in his car. He doesn't use any digital CDs? because he thinks CDs. He has a, he travels around with like a book of like a hundred CDs. Uh, that's funny. actually I got a funny really quick and a little off topic, but really quick. He's traveling back with his girl from Maine uh, last week, and the fucking uh, tape. He has like the old tape thing that like that um, connects to his iPod or whatever the hell he has. Mad old school. He's got an old car. It's like an O2. Anyway, that thing breaks, and now his poor girlfriend's subjected to nothing but Bob Dylan, Grateful Dead, and Fish and for like 10 hours. He was telling me a lot like, of weed this, on that ride. I'm like, this poor girl. She <laughs> she hated it. But um anyway, but like we have a connection to CDs in nostalgia as well. And 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 the sound quality on CDs is better than vinyl. Whether you believe that or not, it is and it's obviously exponentially better than MP3. Um 
So I can understand, and there's convenience in having a CD. You can flip through the tracks and, you know, having a... You can have a CD book in your, in your wherever. You can have a CD book in the car. And you know what? It's a great way to listen to albums, right? It's you a great way to like go through a whole CDs album. like what you, you could do that too. You can, you can go that route if you feel like it, right? But, you know, and, and then obviously the, the, vi- the vinyl thing, you know, the, the sound quality, like I said, the nostalgia, but vinyl's expensive now. And right. I think we saw the resurgence first with vinyl, right? People, vinyl got really popular. Like you saw how many, how many like little, like Urban Outfitter and some of these places, like they sell vinyl and they sell vinyl players and it got cool again to like collect vinyl. So but that now happened. it's yeah. too expensive to collect vinyl. It's and I very think these expensive. kids are like looking for another, like another cheaper outlet that they can collect. And I, I guess it's cassettes. But it's so dumb. <laughs> it's the <laughs> dumbest thing I've ever heard. The, the sound quality is terrible. W- where's the convenience in it? I got to rewind. I got to yeah, rewind, I Cream. I don't know. You gonna Fast carry like a, like a Sony Walkman that, that, that you put your cassette tape in, uh, like or the something? The little yellow, like the yellow one. Yeah, my uncle used to go to work and it would carry that thing around every day. I remember it <laughs> like it's yesterday. <laughs> you click it. You click it closed. <laughs> I don't like, know. So I, it's there's it's, no convenience in this. What, like I said, what's old is new. Like I see a lot of people now in the clubs that have those old school digital cameras or polar, like Polaroids got popular for a while. Then digital cameras got popular again. It's like mad expensive. I don't know. I think people are just like we said, what's old, like what's old is new and nostalgia and people want to be cool. And I guess cassettes are cool again. I don't, <laughs> I'm not buying into it's this. It's the first I've heard of this. So that's why I really wanted to talk about it. Cause like, has anyone else seen or heard of this? Do you know anybody that even has remotely talked about, oh, I picked up a cassette to add to the collection. Like, is that a thing? I, you know, I buy into old stuff all the time, right? I, I'm 100% on board with buying into like older trends and things that were popular at, at one point. This is one that I can't get involved in. Buy low, Gar. Buy low, sell high. You, I'm sure you can go to a record store right now and there's probably a, a wall of cassette tapes that you can take off the owner's hands for pennies. Like I'll take all your cassettes for whatever, 200 bucks. <laughs> like, I'm talking all this shit. I have 50 tapes right now in my living room. Currently. Why? Because, because so you're, part of, a, you're part of the movement. I'm not part of the movement. I'm a, I'm a grateful dead fan. And if anybody has any, knows any history about the grateful dead, their, their entire um, music catalog was moved and, and, and traded about, their live tapes were, were taped by these guys, these tapers that the dead would let in and they take the tapes and that people would, re, um, people would, uh, what should we call it? Copy them. And then they, they pass them out. And then that's how like the legend of the grateful dead grew. They used it as promotion. The grateful dead let tapers tape to use as promotion. And then as the tapes got passed about, it's like, wow, this band is so much better live than they are on their album, which is true they grew a larger and larger audience and fan base. And now like, you know, taper, they, they're still tapers to this day. There's tapers in the, in the grateful dead um, crowd that tape every show. And they had a specific tape that they would use TDK TDKs. I think they were. And I saw, so I have like 50 of them. In Should my- I drop the next cream mix? No Spotify playlist. We're doing it. Cassettes, baby. Holy shit. I remember that was one of my first mixes was on cassette and I would sell them for five bucks in the lunch, in the lunchroom. Can you even go and buy something that you can play cassettes on right now? Like a Sony boom box or something? I, like, I guess Amazon, you can, right? There's something a hundred percent. I'm sure my mom has one in the attic somewhere or in the basement. I can go. You think so? A thousand percent. My mom doesn't throw stuff away. <laughs> You should go check it out. Oh man, I took my mom. Here you I, go. I had to take my mom to the airport today, and she hasn't flown in a really long time. And it was like incredible having to like coach her through everything. It was hilarious. Real, <laughs> it's tough. She's not. A, right. She's not an airplane person. So <laughs> I'm looking hilarious. on Amazon right now, real quick. Cassette. There, I mean, there, there's little cassette player boom boxes, thirty three bucks. There's uh, just a uh, like a. Walkman, I guess you'd call it, right? $28. Wild. I just thought it was funny. I wanted to bring it up. And it was just interesting to me. But for our uh, music conversation, I thought it was a good good topic to at least touch on. Enjoyed that. All right. Let's wrap right here. Um, 
we're back, guys. This is like full sprint to fall, full sprint through the rest of the year. So Gary and I are going to be pumping content and podcasts and all kinds of stuff. So we're excited for the, this is always the busiest time of the year. You know, lock in, get your email shit. us, email us with any questions that you guys might have any, any, um, topics that you might want to hear. Cause you know, we're, we're always down to, to hear some new topics, uh, from you guys and to know what you guys are interested in and what you want to, what you want to hear and what you want to learn about, or what you want to hear us banter about back and forth, anything really. Anything for the show, let us know. For the kids, Gav, for the kids. For the kids. <laughs> All right, guys, thanks for listening to this episode. We'll talk to you guys soon. Peace. All right, guys, peace. Thanks for listening to the Get Down Podcast. If you enjoy our show and find the topics entertaining or helpful in any way, we would greatly appreciate if you could subscribe, rate, and review our podcast wherever you listen to it. We want to help more DJs and subscribing, rating, and reviewing the show is the best way for us to do that. We appreciate all the love so far. Thanks for listening, guys.